Well, good evening to you. I want to welcome you to uh, the uh, this study on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. This is part two of the course. This is TH 464B on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. You should have your syllabus with you, and I would like to go over it for just a few minutes and talk about some of the activities that are on it and some of the things that I believe are important especially in the writing of the essay documents for us. You will find that this particular course is going to be geared uh, to the exposition of Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 27. It has the most extensive teaching anywhere in Scripture on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so much of what we're going to study will be exegetical in its nature. Uh, there will obviously be a lot of practical input because of that. But uh, it will be a little different than TH 464A if you have taken that particular course. I want to uh, identify for you, if I can, the uh, two primary books that will be used in, uh, in, uh, for your text. Uh, both of these are wonderful books by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, the first one is the exposition of Romans chapter 7 verses 1 all the way through chapter 8 verse 4. And you do not have to begin, uh, you do not have to read this entire book. You only have to begin, I believe it is, on chapter 20 which begins Romans chapter 8. And then the second book is a sequel to that. It's... Uh, uh, the exposition of Romans chapter 8 verses 5 through 17. There is a third book uh, that you can obtain if you would like. Most of these books can be bought on CBD and they are uh, about 20 bucks a piece. Uh, th these books are classics. They, uh, you don't find them in print much so I would really encourage you to go and order them if at all possible. If it was me, I would order the second, uh, which would be verses, I mean the third book in the sequel, which is verses 18 all the way through 39 of Romans chapter 8. And then we have a, uh, a third book for just your supplemental reading. I did not bring it with me. Uh, it is the book Strange Fire by Dr. John MacArthur. I believe uh, that in essence it is sort of it is a kind of follow-up to the previous book that he had written uh, called Charismatic Chaos. It will have some things in the book that uh, for, based on your denominational slant may be somewhat controversial to you. That's perfectly fine. You need to read uh, these kind of uh, books for your education just to get a good overview of different views um, so you can read that if you would like if you do uh, you get uh, an extra five points that will be added onto your grade at the end of the semester uh, not to exceed 100 points that can be very important if you for instance uh, um, the A is from 96 to 100 and let's just say that you had a 92 uh, average you had uh, between your exam and your two papers that you had to write, you only had a 92. Well, if you read this, you would get a 97, um, and you would get an A rather than a B in your course. Uh, most of the students uh, are, are going to receive A's and B's. Uh, it's um, just normally the way that it happens. Uh, but if, if you were very close to an A, uh, it would be to your benefit to read the supplemental reading so that you can get, so that you could actually get an A. Uh, the third book is uh, the MLA Handbook. Uh, this is the seventh edition. This is very important. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, this is, this is the uh, standard by which you are to write your papers uh, in accordance with the MLA Handbook. Uh, I would really encourage you to go to chapter 2 and to read about uh, plagiarism. Uh, I don't think uh, that normally that the students 
papers. I, I don't think that a student is just trying to plagiarize. But if you're not used to writing, if you don't write very much, if, if maybe this is your four, first or second course and it's been a long time since you've written, you may not understand what plagiarism is. And it's very, very important. In fact, it can have some serious ramifications for a student if they choose not to, uh, if, if they do not understand plagiarism and they actually exercise that in some part part of their essay. Plagiarism is when you take somebody else's ideas um, and you use those ideas in your paper. Uh, sometimes students may just quote directly from what another author has written. They may, the best thing to do in my mind is if, if you want to use something that somebody else has written uh, then you actually put that in your own words, in your own terms. Um, the whole purpose of writing the essays is for you to do the research. Uh, I'm not interested in you just writing a paper that has all of your ideas in it. You can, as you grow in your ministry, as, uh, if you're going to be a pastor, a teacher of some kind, and you, you want to just use all of your ideas, that's perfectly fine, but not at this level. The whole purpose of these papers is to force you to go out and to do the research and then to document that research. And uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you have a lot of parenthetical citations. That's the way that you document a quote out of MLA. Uh, in fact, I would be more concerned if you did not have many parenthetical citations in your document. I want you to do the research and I want you to use other people's ideas, but my preference is that you put it in your own words. You think about what they have said and you uh, uh, rewrite that in a way that is understandable to you, in a way that you could actually teach it. Um, it's perfectly okay to use a quote, but what I do not want in a document is to just have it full of quotes where you're not actually writing the paper somebody else has written the paper for you and uh, as you as you grow in your ability to write you'll you will you will find uh, that it's much more helpful for you in the long run that you actually uh, put these these ideas in your own words uh, I've had a lot of students uh, ask me personally, uh, whether it's in an online course uh, or a course that I'm teaching, whether it's here in the United States or internationally, as to why in the notes that I give to you that I do not have a bibliography. Please understand that every note that you have, every note that I've given to you, is that much of what's in those documents is not original to me. There's obviously a lot that is but there is probably more that is not. I'm just not smart enough and I'm not really interested in being creative with the information that I provide to you. So over the years I have developed these these studies um, probably over the last 15 years or so and when I first started I developed many of them for my, my, my church and there was no need for me to actually document in a bibliographic way that information. Uh, over the last several years, as I've been developing more and more courses, I'm developing a couple of courses right now, one on Hebrews, one on the church. I've documented everything. I have a long bibliography uh, for the studies that I have. Uh, I've talked some of these already. And so, if, if uh, I just did not get into the habit initially of documenting where I got my information because I was simply using it at my church. I just didn't see that it was necessary. However, over the years, as I have developed a course, uh, this particular course I've taught many times, I keep adding to it, I keep developing it, I keep refining it, trying to help it, and so, uh, but I have not I did not start initially documenting the information and so I have not continued to document that information as I've gone 
along. Um, I, it, these are not things that I ever intend to publish. If I did, I would have to go back and do the bibliography research again and document where I got the information. So in your essay, what I'm really interested in is you finding ideas, insight, wisdom, understanding, whatever it may be, uh, in the research that you do and then documenting that for me. You're going to, in my mind, you're going to get more credit for me for the documentation than not documenting something. And so be very careful that when you use somebody else's idea that you document that. Now, there is a term that I've used in the past. Uh, if you're reading a, a particular author and he says something that is what I want to call an obvious observation. It's obvious. Anybody that would be reading that passage would would uh, would come to the same conclusion. Uh, you don't have to document that. Uh, what you have to document are the ideas uh, that somebody that is not your own, something that you maybe didn't recognize. There are going to be a lot of things that that the authors of these uh, other books that you research, they're going to say things that you already know. Things that are not unique to them, something that they got from somebody else. And so there's a there's a there's a there's some flexibility there on your part. I'm not going to penalize you for for not documenting the obvious. Uh, if you were reading through, I'll just make a, a, a say an example here. If you were documenting. Uh, the number of times that the word spirit was used in Romans chapter 1 verses, uh, I mean Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 27 that we're going to be studying, it would be obvious. Uh, if somebody said, well, it's used 16 times or 18 times, however many times it is, I, you, you don't have to, that's not plagiarism, that's just an obvious observation. But let's say, for instance, that you go to an author and that author uh, gives you a list of five or six, maybe eight different items that he that he uh, documents uh, in some way. Maybe it's in an alliteration of eight different items or five different items. Uh, they're not unique to you. They're unique to him. And you use those in your document, even if you put them in your own words. They still need to be, you need to have a parenthetical citation uh, with that because it's their idea it's something that's unique it's unique to them so be very careful with that I, I'm not I, I'm not here in, in any way when I grade the papers my intent is to help you as much as I can I realize that some of you are not used to writing and I'm going to take that into consideration in other words if you took the first course TH 464A and I made comments on your paper and you incorporated them say in the second essay and it, that's what I want that's improvement and I'm going to reward you for that improvement if you don't incorporate those comments and here you're writing uh, you're taking this course and this would be the third and the fourth paper that you've written and you don't incorporate those comments I'm going to I'm going to subtract from your score you need to be implementing the, the, the comments that I put on, on your papers. So uh, just take that in mind. Uh, I want you to do well. I want to be an encouragement to you uh, as you write to uh, recognize things that are good about your paper and about your effort. I want to reward your effort as well. Um, I would encourage some of you to use uh, the spell check feature um, and if you use Word, uh, a Microsoft Word document, it has um, under the references tab at the, at the top of the page, it has, it's already set up the program to create your bibliography or what uh, MLA calls the works cited and it's very very easy to use you just 
you uh, hit um, uh, you hit another tab, and it 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 takes you to a a form. You just put in the information, and it automatically creates the works cited page for you. So at the end, all you have to do is just put insert works cited or insert bibliography, and it will insert it in that final page for you. So. Uh, if you are not used to using Word, I want to encourage you to either write me or you can call me. Uh, normally the evening would be the best time to get in touch with me. And I will sit down with you on the phone and walk you through how to do these things. I want you to be a good writer. If you're not a good writer, you will not be a good speaker. And so I want to help you to be able to do that. I would say that the majority of the students are not good with Microsoft Word. They've just not used it enough to know what it can actually do for them. So I will be more than happy to help you. If you have Skype, if you use Skype, I will be glad to Skype with you. And I can turn, I can turn the... Uh, uh, camera around on my laptop computer and actually show you on the screen what it is that uh, on my other computer what it is that you need to know and how to develop the document. I'm more than willing to do that. I'm more than willing to help you to become a good writer. You have two papers. One is going to be walking and living according to the Spirit and I want to encourage those of you that took uh, the first course on the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, that there were a couple of studies in there on this very subject. You're more than welcome to use those as a resource. Um, some of my students do that quite frequently. They'll use my notes from another course. That's more than uh, uh, proper. Uh, there's a, a course, uh, there's a, a writing assignment on the blessings and benefits uh, of our adoption, which is something that is done for us by the Holy Spirit. Very, very meaningful concept. And then the final exam will be taken from the course notes. They, there will be much that I teach to you during, during these different sessions that are not necessarily in the course notes. Just examples that I may use, uh, just impromptu statements that I'm going to say. You will not be... You will not be tested on those things that are not in the course notes. And, and the test will be chronological. We'll start with the first session like we have today, and we'll go all the way through all 16 of them. And the first question will be from course one, uh, from the teaching in, in the, our, our first uh, session here. And it will be chronological. I will not be skipping back and all over. Uh, I'm not interested in making you do that, uh, make that kind of effort. I don't see any value in that. If I had my way about it, I would not even give you a final exam. But just by law, we have to do that. And so I'm going, to, uh, I've, I've tried to make that final exam something that helps you just to go back through and review the material, find the answers, things that you can remember, and uh, hopefully that will be helpful to you in the long run. I want to say that uh, one of the areas that I would really like for you to work on when it comes to the writing of the papers is to do your best not to use a great number of personal pro uh, pronouns like I, you, uh, he, she, it, we, you, they. Now you have to use those. There are times when you're giving examples that you have to use personal pronouns. I, I do it all the time, um, especially when I'm teaching. And I think that when I'm actually teaching that it is probably, um, it can be more emphatic for me to say you, uh, but if you go through the notes, you'll see that I have tried to take out most of the personal pronouns. There are some places where I leave them. But what I want you to appreciate and understand is that you are writing a formal document. This is not, this is a research paper. You're not having a conversation with me. 
We're not sitting down at a table drinking some tea and eating a piece of cake and just talking about things. This is a document where you are doing formal research. This is not an informal conversation that we are having. Um, and so from that perspective, the way that you write the document ought to be in a more formal format. Uh, I am writing a 75,000 word thesis on Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 7. And in that thesis, I have gone through as best as, as, as I can, and I've taken out every personal pronoun that's in there and given it another word. You'll find a lot of times it may even become redundant to you that in the course notes that I use the word believer or Christian rather than saying you, I would say the believer or a believer or a Christian or a follower of Christ. Uh, I'm using a, a, a noun rather than a pronoun. And you will find that in the long run that it will make you a much better writer to become more formal. If you teach, you can informalize that any way that you want to. But in a writing document, if, if you went through a commentary, say, on Romans chapter 8, uh, there are plenty of excellent commentaries uh, on Romans chapter 8 where you can get a lot of information about uh, what we're going to be discussing for this entire uh, online course. But you will find that most of the good commentary writers do not use personal pronouns. There may be an instance where they do. Uh, some may be inclined to do it more than others. But the, those men, those uh, people that write that are more technical, you will find that they do not use a lot of personal pronouns. It's just not uh, a good writing habit. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I don't want to have to keep telling you over and over on each one of these courses that you may take under me to not do that. Uh, I want you to learn the discipline of doing it. There are a lot of times when I'm writing, I write for a theological journal every month. I write a long, a very long article um, for a theological journal called the Talmud. Dr. Eddie Ildefonso, who's one of the other online professors, uh, he writes for it. It actually is a journal that he has created. We probably have a distribution list of over 11,000 people at the current time, and it just constantly keeps growing. Well, I may have a document or a theme that I'm writing on. Uh, I'm doing, I'm writing, for instance, right now on the church. I mean, on uh, Hebrews. And, uh, but I always go back through and take out the personal pronouns. Even though I may have taught that material in a more personal way, in a formal document where I've, I've, I've researched, I've got documentation, I've got bibliography, I do not use the, those personal pronouns. If you have any questions about the syllabus, you're more than welcome to send me an email and I will be glad to answer any question that you may have. I appreciate your input. Uh, each semester I get uh, wonderful, precious encouragement from students. It is encouragement that I personally need. I want to know that what we, you are learning, what I'm teaching, is beneficial to you. It's something that you are uh, enjoying. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be creative with the material. I, I have no intention of being creative with God's Word. I want to just uh, do the exposition and the exegesis of these passages and find out what it says and then communicate that to you in a way that hopefully is meaningful to you. So I appreciate your effort. I, I hope that uh, uh, I can be of a benefit to you in the writing area and that uh, I can be a benefit to you in the teaching sessions that we have. Today I want to begin just uh, the introduction into Romans chapter 8 and uh, this study is going to look at what is really the central message relative to the work of the Holy Spirit that's found anywhere in the scriptures. It's in Romans 8 verses 1 through 27. 
That certainly is not to say that there aren't other areas of uh, other passages of Scripture that communicate about the Holy Spirit because there certainly are, but there's no other place in all of the Scripture where the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit is illuminated in the way that it is here in Romans chapter 8. In a sense, it is the crown jewel of information relative to His work in the believer's life. For me personally, Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in all of Scripture. Romans 8, 28 is my life verse that all things work together for good for those that love God and are the called according to His purpose. Uh, in his outstanding commentary on Romans 8, James Montgomery Boyce uh, begins his exposition of this chapter titling it the greatest chapter in the Bible. And uh, I would not differ with him at all. I think the other greatest chapter in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 9. But Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 8 uh, is, uh, and especially the, the conclusion that Paul comes to, his doxology there at the end of Romans chapter 8, which we're not going to cover, has got to be absolutely the most uh, incredible doxology given anywhere in all of the scriptures. Just an amazing, amazing uh, doxology uh, on the work of God in Christ in our life. Now, these are these truths that we're going to be studying. They are what I would consider to be very vital and very crucial tr uh, truths in this one chapter alone. And if you are willing to simply spend time to understand these truths, I think that in the long run that they will have a life transforming impact on you. They will they have the ability innately within them within these words that we're going to be looking at to change your life. Uh, Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There are things that we're going to learn here I think that will have life transforming results in any genuine sincere believers life and I want you to appreciate that right here at the very beginning. This is not a trivial study that we're not studying this is not psychology 101. Uh, we're not stud this is not a history lesson. This is a study on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And they are life transforming truths here. It is much more than just reading these verses several times or even studying them. Um, right now I'm teaching uh, uh, I'm teaching on Hebrews at my church and uh, I have asked my congregation to read Hebrews chapter 9 every day and to just spend some time in it, to meditate on it because I want them to internalize it. I haven't actually even started teaching on that. I'm still in Hebrews chapter 8. But I want them to internalize those truths that are there in that tremendous chapter. And that's the only way that these great truths will have any impact on your life. They have to become real to you. You have to appreciate that God is providing to you in these verses foundational insight and wisdom and information that is crucial and vital for a believer and for his walk with God. Uh, it, it's a matter of, of knowing these verses, of studying them, applying them, and praying that the Holy Spirit will provide His illumination so that the eyes of your understanding will be opened. And when that happens, they should have what I consider to be a very life-transforming impact on your life. This is the very nature of these kind of words. I want you to appreciate at the beginning here that doctrine is foundational to your understanding. There are a lot of students that don't like doctrine. Uh, I'm the exact opposite. I, I, want, I want to study everything that is doctrinal. You'll find in uh, all of the courses that, uh, uh, that I will teach uh, online, most every one of them will be doctrinal in nature. Uh, 
that m my whole life is is built around studying and teaching doctrine and so these are very vital and, and, and crucial truths that you're going to find here in this chapter 8. It seems uh, to me this is just a personal opinion so you can adjust it uh, as you desire but it seems to me that one of the reasons that many professing Christians have no evident heartfelt conviction about Christ and about the things of God is simply because these great truths of Scripture that we're studying don't mean that much to them. In fact, I find that a lot of what I would consider to be uh, uh, immature Christians are not willing to spend time in the more doctrinal books of the Bible. If I were to give you a list of those doctrinal books, they would be the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, uh, the book of Ephesians, the book of Hebrews, and the book of 1 John. Obviously there is doctrine in all of the books, uh, but the primary foundational doctrines that we have in this church age are going to be found in those five books. You might take a book like Acts, for instance, and Acts is a wonderful book, but it is primarily a historical narrative. And you, it's not a place that you go to develop doctrine. It certainly is a place that supports doctrine, but it's not a place that develops it, say, in the same way that Paul develops the doctrine of justification by faith in, in the book of Romans. In the book of Hebrews, you have the doctrine of the great uh, high priestly ministry of Christ. Uh, it is developed all the way through the first ten chapters. And if you don't glean that, if you don't understand what the high priestly ministry of Christ is to you right now and what it's going to be in the future, in the eternal state, then you will miss one of the greatest truths in all of Scripture relative to the person of Jesus Christ. And so, a lot of Christians, they just, these kind of passages do not have much meaning to them. They, they're too doctrinal. They think it's too hard to study doctrine. And I would say, I, I would agree that the doctrinal passages, you have to be much more cerebral in your effort. I think they do take more effort to understand. If you've never taught, for instance, Hebrews chapter 6, or never taught on the five major warnings in the book of Hebrews, uh, then you may not even understand what I'm talking about. It's a very, very controversial, difficult passage. It's not, it's not difficult to me. I think it's very clear what the Scripture is saying uh, in Hebrews chapter 6. I think it's just as clear as it can be. But for many people, it's considered to be the most difficult passage in all of the Word of God. And so, uh, you, want to, you, you want to take these great truths and you want to let them impact your life. And some Christians, they just ignore these great truths. They'd be bored to tears with a course like this because it's, it primarily is going to be doctrinal in nature. It's not going to have all of the exhortation, say, that a book like 1 Timothy may have. Uh, it's just not going, it's not built like that this particular passage that we're going to be studying. And so they just don't pay much attention to these things. They kind of overlook them. They just casually pass by these particular passages. But it's the truth of God that's understood, loved, and applied that actually changes the believer's life. John chapter 8 uh, says in verse 32 that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So it's important to observe something I think here initially about Romans chapter 8. We want to, if I can say it this way, we want to get up at the 30,000 foot level and we want to look down on how all of this sort of develops within the book of 
Romans, this issue of the work of the Holy Spirit here in Romans chapter 8. And what I want you to appreciate is that in the first seven chapters of Romans is that the Holy Spirit is only mentioned three times. I want to read those to you, okay? The first is in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. It says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. In chapter 5, so there he's called uh, the Spirit of holiness. In chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So not only is He the Spirit of holiness, but He is the one who actually takes this tremendous love that God has for us and He just pours it out into our hearts. I'm sure there have been times in your life where you have experienced exactly that. You have experienced a time when maybe you were reading the Scriptures or you were... Uh, 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 in a service somewhere and somebody was opening up the Word of God to you and just your heart just felt overwhelmed. Uh, I remember just in one of our services recently, one of the members of our church was just overcome in the service by something that I was teaching on out of Hebrews chapter 8. And I, I look down out of the pulpit and I look down and I see her and she is just weeping. She, she, uh, the Lord was just pouring out uh, these amazing truths into her life. And it got to a place where it literally overwhelmed her and she, she could not contain it. Well, you know what that was? It was the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit pouring out the love of God in her heart. And then in chapter 7 verse 6 it says, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And here we find that one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is that He makes the things of God new to us. He makes them uh, uh, they, they become vital to us. They become refreshing to us, I think, would be the proper way of, of stating what it is that he actually does. However, when we get here to Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 19 times in, from verse 1 all the way through verse 27. That's more than six times more than the previous seven chapters. So he's mentioned here six times more in the most doctrinal book in the Scriptures. He's mentioned six times more in one chapter alone than he is in the first seven chapters. And so obviously when God mentions something over and over, that's the emphasis of the passage. That's the emphasis. That's what he's really trying to communicate to us. And so in Romans chapter 8, the primary subject, all the way through verse 27, is the supernatural and life-changing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I want you to appreciate that simple fact that right here, in Romans chapter 8 is that you're going to find, we're going to find those truths that are, have the most impact on us relative to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are plenty of other places. There are many other places in the scripture, John chapter 14, John chapter 16, that talk about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. So I don't want to limit I don't want to limit in any way our understanding of what the Holy Spirit does, but this chapter consolidates most all of that 
into this very, very condensed, powerful teaching on the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Paul's gone to great lengths in Romans 1 through 5 to impart to the believer the very simple truth that we have been justified by faith alone. Uh, we are justified before God. We have been de judicially declared. That's sort, that is a legal term. The, this idea of justification, it's a judicial term, a forensic term. It's a, it's a legal term that Paul used. And we have been declared righteous and justified in the sight of God by the faith that he actually provides to us. So salvation is a complete work of God. It is a uh, work of a sovereign God. And he has declared the believer to be righteous, to be holy uh, in his sight, apart from any work on their part. He gave the sinner the grace to believe. He gave the sinner the grace to repent. And he gave them the gift of salvation uh, in the new birth, in regeneration, and in what we call conversion. Every believer, every believer has been birthed by the Holy Spirit, born again by the Holy Spirit, and brought into the kingdom of God by the sovereign will of God alone. And unless the Holy Spirit had drawn the believer they would never have come. If you go to John chapter 6, verse, uh, I believe it's verse 44, it says, unless the Spirit of God draws a man, he cannot come. So, just in coming to Christ, just in your personal salvation experience, there was this unique and powerful work of the Holy Spirit to draw you, to woo you to Christ. He does that through what's known as the new birth. I think the the technical term that we ought to be comfortable with is regeneration. It's when God gives someone that is, is completely, totally, spiritually dead, gives them the ability to believe, and then draws them to Christ, and then gives them the grace to b believe. And in that salvific work, God justified the believer, and Paul spent five chapters teaching that one single truth. That God is the one who did that. However, beginning in Romans chapter 6, Paul begins to teach on the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. So we've gone in, if you can kind of follow this from a theological sort of oversight here, he's gone from, from uh, being dead in sins to regeneration, to justification. And now, he begins talking in chapter 6 about this issue of sanctification. And he begins to teach on the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And he completes that teaching in Romans chapter 8. When you get to Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11, it is talking about the sovereignty of God. Probably the greatest three chapters anywhere in all of Scripture on the sovereignty of God. Some of the most important three chapters that any believer could ever study. And, but here in Romans chapter 8, we have this incredible emphasis on the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit and in the believer's life. And the message is simple. I want you to appreciate the simplicity of what Paul, as the author, is actually trying to communicate to us. Once again, we're, up, we're not in the detail yet. We're up at the 30,000 foot level. We're trying to get kind of an overview of what Paul is actually saying to his readers. And what he wants them to know is that the believer cannot live the Christian life in their own strength. It must be lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul has talked about the sinfulness of man, about the utter hopelessness of his condition. I mean, if you go to Romans chapter 1 and 2, uh, it's, and then we finally get to Romans chapter 3 beginning in verse 
believe it's verse 10 or 11 through verse 18, and he has this, uh, there's none who understand, there's, there's no one who seeks after God, no, there's not one. Uh, he just talks about the utter depravity of man in his sin. And he's painting the picture for us that salvation is not something that a man can produce on his own. He's talking about the utter depravity of man. And, uh, in, in theological terms, in, in uh, Reformed theological terms, it's called total depravity. And that passage there, Romans 3, would be the classic passage. They're all quotations out of the Old Testament. But, uh, so he paints that picture, and then he introduces, uh, beginning in chapter 3, uh, 4 and 5, the doctrine of grace, that uh, we now have peace with God in chapter 5. Uh, and then he arrives at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It's got to be one of the most spectacular, staggering verses found anywhere in Scripture when he says that there is now, therefore, there is there now, there there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And right here, we find ourselves at the very pinnacle, at the height, at at. At, at, the, at the, 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 the top of the mountain of God's grace in our life. The first three chapters declare to every man and woman to be utterly guilty before a holy God and guilty without any recourse on their own. Even when they knew God, they were not willing to honor Him as God. Created idols, worshipped those idols. And three times it says in Romans chapter 1 that God gave them up. God gave them over to their lust and to their passions and to do what they wanted to do. It's like God says, you don't want me? Okay. I'm just going to give you over to your sin. And sin has its own obvious consequences in a person's life. And so uh, he talked there about the wrath of God. He talked about the wages of sin is death. Both temporal death and eternal death. And just as a sampling, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Listen, you cannot, you, you cannot read those first two chapters, actually the first two and a half chapters, without appreciating that almost everything that Paul says uh, is dealing with God's condemnation. It's dealing with God's wrath on the unbeliever and how uh, uh, those people are guilty and uh, so it, it's a it, it's it's a picture there that is as powerful of a picture of condemnation as you will find anywhere in the scriptures but now when we get to chapter 8 it's, it's, it's like it's the reverse it's like it's the exact opposite in one case, he's talking about condemnation, and in the next case, he's talking about no condemnation. And that is the state that we find ourselves in when we come to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. That's my new status before God. That's your status before God. Are you going to fail? Absolutely. Are you going to make uh, mistakes in your life, some more serious than others? Certainly, you will. Or is there going to be sin in your life? There will be. There may be secret sin in your life. There may be different areas of your life that uh, you are weak in. Areas where you, you're, you're still growing. Uh, but, but there's no condemnation. You, are in, you have a new status before God. You have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And God wants you to understand that. 
It's a place of great freedom. You know, I don't get up every morning uh, th thinking about how bad I am or, you know, what a terrible sinner I am. Do I know that I'm a, a sinner like everybody else? Absolutely. Uh, am I proud of some things that I may do or some attitude that I may have or some, some, something that I may have just uh, sinned against God or sinned against somebody else? I'm not proud of any of those things. But I know, I know from the Word of God, especially right here in Romans chapter 8, that I, there's no condemnation. That God's not, God, God has already dealt with my sin. He's dealt with your sin. He dealt with sin at the cross. It's a done deal. It, there, there, there's no more debate. Uh, 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 it's, it's a finished work that Jesus Christ did. And God the Father, the the technical term, the theological term, is the word propitiation, in that God the Father completely accepted the, sa the sacrifice. It actually means that He was satisfied with the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our part. He's totally satisfied with it. Just completely, 100%, there's no question in His mind, that was a sufficient sac sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, both in the Incarnation and in his death, burial, and resurrection. So this is a chapter from beginning to end on the believer's eternal security. Listen, this tremendous work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and as we go through the practical aspects of it, as we begin to delineate, if, after we, we take a doctrine, we understand a particular doctrine, for instance, uh, when we look at the doctrine of our adoption. What we're going to find in that is that in the New Testament times when Paul wrote about adoption that an adopted son actually had more rights than a natural born son. That's a tremendous truth to appreciate and to understand. He had more rights. A natural born son could be disowned by his father. But a, an adopted son could not. Um, a, a natural born son, for whatever reasons may occur in that family familial relationship, could be denied um, his inheritance. A nat, uh, an adopted son, by law, was required to be given an inheritance. So, the natural born son, the, the adopted son, had more rights in the family than did the natural born son. Now, those are great truths for us to appreciate and to understand. They, they ought to be, an, when we get to that, it ought to be an incredible encouragement to us relative to our personal eternal security. And uh, I think you'll find that Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39 that I mentioned earlier is the, probably the greatest tech, uh, doxology uh, in all of the Word of God. And he says that now that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. There's nothing. There's no sin that you can commit. There's nothing that the enemy can do. There's no event that can take place in your life. There's nothing that's going to happen later on. There's nothing that's happened in the past or anything that can happen right now that can separate us from this incredible relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. This chapter is absolutely incredible. This is a staggering chapter. In my mind, it's the greatest chapter in all of the Word of God. And it just resonates with the simple fact that the Christian life is a spiritual life that is lived in the Spirit and because of the Spirit. If, if you went and you did a, an analysis, a technical analysis of the word spiritual, it is a word that simply means of the Spirit. Uh, if you have spiritual gifts, they are gifts been given to you by the Spirit. They are gifts of the Spirit. And so when a person is spiritual, there are characteristics in their life that reflect the person of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, he is the one that calls us. He regenerates us. He renews us. He teaches us. He encourages us. He empowers us. He sets us free from sin. He helps us to put to death the deeds of the, bo of the body, of the flesh. We'll find out in this passage that He leads us. All those that are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. He strengthens us. And we're going to find in this remarkable passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27 of this incredible intercession that the Holy Spirit makes on our behalf. The same is said of Christ in Hebrews chapter 7, verse um, 25 and 26, I believe that it is, or 24 and 25. And here in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, we're going to find, and I don't use the word prayer. It's the word intercession. It says that we don't know how to pray as we ought, but that He intercedes for us. He makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That will be the last thing, one of the last things that we study, and, uh, but it is a remarkable, remarkable truth. I think that that language that is used there uh, by the Holy Spirit, is, it, it's, it cannot be uttered. It's not something that you could even understand. Uh, it is so deep and so profound, His intercession on our behalf. So anything that you and I ever do that brings any kind of meaningful honor and glory to the person of Christ, to God the Father, it will be a work that has been accomplished because of the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. And without His work in your life, you would never honor or glorify Christ, ever. And I can say this with all the confidence in the world, if for some, if for some reason... God the Father decided at some moment that He was going to remove the Holy Spirit from your life. Let's just say, for instance, today, that God chose, for whatever reason, to remove the Holy Spirit from my life. My spiritual life would absolutely collapse. It would deteriorate in a matter of hours if I did not have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. My flesh would take over, the world would take over, the devil would take over. But that is not going to take place. In fact, that is a spiritual impossibility. And that's part of our eternal security and being able to appreciate that and to know that. Now, I want you, if you have a Bible, I'd like for you to turn, uh, you should have a Bible. <laughs> I would like for you to turn in it to Romans chapter 8. And what I want to do is just in a very brief way is I want to identify all that Romans has to say or all that Romans 8 has to say relative to the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. This is not an exposition of any of these verses. I'm just going to uh, indicate the verse and what it, that verse actually says about the Holy Spirit's work in our life. That's uh, just a recognition that in each one of these verses that there is something significant that is given to us relative to uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer and for the believer. In verse chapter 1, we've just talked about this. The Holy Spirit has brought every believer into a no-condemnation status. I want you to appreciate that the will of God the Father and the will of Christ, uh, if you went to John chapter 17, you will find that Christ is actually the one who sent the Holy Spirit. He understood that when He left, that His disciples were going to need His continued work in their life, but He wasn't going to be there. So He said that when He left, He prayed and asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit which he did, but it was at the request of Christ that the Holy Spirit be sent into our life. So the Holy Spirit is the one who executes the will of God. So if you have a no condemnation status, if, I, if we have a no condemnation status in our life, it is a status that has been 
given to us by God. It's a judicial status that has been given to us by God, but it is being implemented in our life by the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So He is the one that has brought each of us into a no condemnation status. And because we are now in Christ, we are able to walk according to the Holy Spirit and not according to the dictates of our flesh. That's what it says. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. And I'll add these words to the passage. But now they walk according to the Spirit. So one of the evidences of someone being a genuine believer, they actually walk in accordance to what the Holy Spirit would desire for their life. In verse 2, he is actually called the Spirit of life. What that means is that he is a life-giving spirit. It's not just that he has life, it's that he gives life. He is the one who provides spiritual life to the believer. If the Holy Spirit was removed from your life, there would be no spiritual life. Um, he is the one, he is the spirit of this life transforming work that is going on within each of us. And so he's made every believer free from the present and operative law of sin and death. That we'll look at that in detail. In verse 4, he helps the believer to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Uh, I want to do that. Uh, there's nothing in, in the law of God, there's nothing in the, uh, I'm talking specifically about the moral law of God uh, that's been given to us in the Old Testament and is cer certainly replete in the New Testament. I want to do that. I want to love God with all my heart and soul and mind and I don't want to have any other gods before Him and I don't want to uh, covet my neighbor's wife and I, I want to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy. I want to honor God's day. I don't want to steal. I, there are things that are right. And the Holy Spirit is the one who not only gives us a desire to do those things in our life, but He's the one who strengthens us so that we can. So in verse 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit has delivered the believer from the penalty of sin. He's delivered them from the condemnation of the law. Tremendous, tremendous truth. But in the verses that follow, verses 5 all the way through verse 14, Paul declares that the Holy Spirit has delivered the believer from themselves and from the power of sin that wants to reign over their life. This may be the most significant section that we study. Not that one part is more important than another, but just at a practical level to understand and appreciate that something has actually taken place in our life. We're not talking about theory. We're not talking about something that, that has the potential of taking place. What we're going to find here is that the Holy Spirit, past tense, has delivered us from the power of sin that wants to reign over our lives. In verse 5, it says that he helps the believer to set their mind on the things of God and not on the things of the flesh. You know, I would think that just by the fact that you are taking this course, just by the fact that you are wanting to learn more about, about the Holy Spirit, about Christ, I would, I would think that, that just that alone should be evidence to you that the Holy Spirit is helping you to place your mind on the things of Christ and the things of God and not on the things of the flesh. In verse 9, we find that the believer knows that they are one of God's children because of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence in them. I've been a Christian for almost 43 years. And I can honestly say, I, I don't say this in any braggadocious way, I, I'm not trying to be arrogant, uh, as if I had some unique special experience uh, uh, in my salvation. But I can honestly say that in the nearly 43 years that I have been saved, that I have never one time 
doubted my salvation. Not one time. There were some sections of uh, passages of Scripture that early on as a young believer, I just simply didn't understand. Uh, I remember before I, I attended Southwestern Seminary, um, I was always a little confused about uh, the passage of Scripture that spoke about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit would never be forgiven. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was one of those passages that I, I just never fully understood. But I must remark that even though I did not fully understand it, I never ever doubted the fact that I was still born again. It was a life transforming, salvific moment in my life and it just began to grow and enlarge and it was all a work of the Holy Spirit in my life. We know in verse 10 here that he helps the believer to live a life of righteousness. You know there are things that we all do that are inappropriate. Uh, it, I, there, there's not a single one of us that doesn't have things in our life that we don't want anybody else to know about. I, I certainly have those kind of things in my life that I, I, I just don't want anybody else to know that I was that big of a, a, a sinner. But by the same token here, I can honestly look at my life and I can see that God has helped me to live a life of righteousness. I was sharing with my church recently that uh, I, I've been uh, a pastor at my church for 19 years. I uh, just finished my 18th year, beginning my 19th year. And, uh, I, and, and uh, we've had uh, many people come and, and uh, I can look at their life. Uh, many of them were saved in our church and I, I watched them grow and they're much more, um, uh, their life, just has a whole different standard to it. Uh, and it's, it's all because the Holy Spirit helps the believer to live a life of righteousness. I can just look at their life and say, boy, you have really grown in your Christian life. You've, just, you've grown by leaps and bounds in your Christian life. I have, a, I have a man in my church that I took to Zimbabwe with me. Uh, and it was the first time that he had ever been on any kind of mission trip. And, uh, and be quite honest with you, I don't think that he had ever really shared the gospel with anybody at, to, any, to any really meaningful level. And uh, we got there, and the first couple of days he struggled a little bit. I, I had discipled him and the other men that went with me. Uh, we were out in the bush, and... Uh, by the third day, he just he 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 was just on fire, and he cannot wait until we go back again. Uh, we're going to go back in several months, and he just simply cannot wait. He he just grown grown so immensely through that. It's you know what that is. Is it his enthusiasm? No. It is the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in somebody that has been yielded to them. And the number of people that he won to the Lord during that week and a half that they were there is, was enormous. Uh, just uh, so many people came to Christ through this individual's commitment. It says in verse 11 that he gives life to the believer's mortal body. Uh, he he just uh, uh, we're dead in sins, <laughs> and uh, he makes us alive. We'll talk about that in verse 13. He helps the believer to put to death the deeds of the body so that they might truly experience his life. He empowers them to be able to live victoriously over sin. Thank goodness. We will always be plagued by sin. There's never a moment. There's not. There's not going to be a day where sin doesn't plague us in some way. The Holy Spirit is going to help us to live victoriously over that sin. In verse 14, He leads and He guides the believer. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. That's a great, great uh, passage there. And in the next several verses, Paul declares that the Holy Spirit has given 
the believer a new standing before God. They used to be slaves to sin, but now they have been brought into a, a relationship where they are free from its controlling power, and they are actually called sons. They are called children of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. In verse 15, he causes the believer to cry out, Abba, Father, as his identification of their sonship. Sonship, we'll study this when we get there, but sonship is what gives us our access to God. It's what allows us to come into the presence of God. It's this unique thing called sonship. In verse 16, he bears witness with the believer's spirit that they are genuinely children of God. It says the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, I, I, I just never doubt my salvation. I, I never doubt that I'm born again. I never doubt that I'm going to die and go to heaven. Uh, you know, I battled with cancer twice. Uh, I may have to battle with it again. Who knows? But in all of that, I realized, I mean, the Spirit bore witness with my spirit that I was one of His children. Everything was okay. And they have a saying in Zimbabwe. They say, it's all right, it's okay. And they say that all the time. You know, you, you'll be in a hurry. They'll say, it's all right, it's okay. And it's almost like that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. We struggle with something, we, 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 we get frustrated, maybe irritated, and he comes along and he just says, it's all right, it's, it's okay, everything is okay. So he bears witness that we are his children. In verse 23, he creates a hunger within his children for their, their redemption to be made complete. The, the creation is groaning, everything is groaning. Uh, all of creation is groaning and we're groaning because we want to be redeemed uh, by the Spirit of God. We want our redemption to be made complete. In verse 26, 26 he helps believers in their weakness and intercedes on their behalf. We have to recognize that we have weaknesses. There are things that we don't know how to pray for as we ought. But the Holy Spirit prays for us, and He intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then in verse 27, a remarkable verse is that He intercedes for us in accordance with the will of God. Now, I think that one of the great truths that God wants the believer to understand from this chapter is really a very, very simple truth. Listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. This is one of the dynamics of this course. These are, this is one of the principles of this course that it's built on. This is one of its premises that it's established on. And it's the simple truth that the Holy Spirit is sufficient to meet every need in a believer's life. Not most of the needs, not some of the needs, not a good amount of the needs, He's able to meet every single need that a believer has in their life. You know, when Christ walked with His disciples, there was never a single time in His ministry where they did not have everything that they needed to be successful in their walk. I was uh, reading in just my devotions recently about, uh, in the book of Luke, how when God sent His disciples out, He, he called them to Himself, and then he, he actually sent them out, and He gave them power and authority to do what it was that He wanted them to do. When they needed money for taxes, He told them to go fishing, of all things. They caught a fish, He says, open its mouth, it's got a coin in there. Uh, when they were out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and a storm that came up, uh, he calmed the storm. He, one time he came walking on the water. Uh, there was never a time 
when there was a multitude of people that surrounded them and they were, they were hungry and had no food, he made them sit down in groups of 50 and he took five loaves and two fishes uh, and broke them and, and fed everybody. When somebody needed a miraculous work, he was able to perform that. There's never a time that his disciples did not have everything that they needed. But when he was resurrected, he had no intentions of leaving them alone so that now they were dependent on themselves. So at Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with them and to be to them everything that he was when he was with them on the earth. This is what he told his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 16 through 18. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And he comes to them through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. I think there are three prepositions that you'll find in Scripture relative to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. He will be, uh, he will be with us, He will be in us, and at times He will be upon us. The Holy Spirit will come on us, be with us, and be in us. In John chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, and verse 8, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jer Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then we read of the actual event that occurred in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 4 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, the simple message here in the sending of the Holy Spirit is that God, Christ, has not left the believer alone. He has not left him to his own resources. He's not left him to his own understanding, to his own wisdom. He's not left him to his own strength. Thank goodness for all of that. He has given to each believer the mighty, indwelling, prevailing, powerful presence of the Holy Spirit to live in them and to be with them and to be upon them. They began the Christian life under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who took the gospel, made it alive to them, made Christ alive to their heart. He is the one who convicted them of sin and gave them the desire to even repent, gave them the, the grace to believe. So no one ever even begins the Christian life apart from this supernatural, powerful influence and work of the Holy Spirit on their behalf. And so, 
in a sense, just understanding all of that, it would be ludicrous on our part to think that we can continue to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, apart from Him. That's the problem that the Galatian believers had. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3. He said, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So the problem is really very simple. Believers many times have overestimated themselves while at the same time underestimating God. They give, them a lot, they give themselves a lot more credit than they should and they give God a lot less credit than they should. They've made what I want to call a very tragic spiritual miscalculation. And in the process, they have refused to give God glory. They have stolen the glory for themselves. You know, over the years, uh, there are just certain things that God has taught me, certain things that I have learned. I remember one time I, I had uh, the opportunity of having uh, uh, Chuck Smith, who was the pastor of the initial Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California. And uh, he passed away this past year, but uh, uh, he was in our home one time, had, had uh, visited with us to eat with us. This was a good number of years ago, probably back in the 80s sometime. He, uh, he came to our home. We, 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 uh, we had invited him to come. And he did. And I was just talking to him one time, and I asked him, I said, uh, I said, uh, Chuck, I said, um, if you could just, if you had just one thing that you could tell somebody, a young Christian, uh, a young pastor, uh, somebody that's going into the ministry, what would it be? And uh, he said, Gary, he said, I would tell them this. He said, don't touch the money, don't touch the women, and don't touch the glory. If you touch any of those things, God will remove his hand off of your life. And you know, I have never forgotten those three things. And uh, the worst thing that we can do is to steal the glory of what the Holy Spirit is doing, of what God is doing in our life. We can claim that glory for ourselves. You know, believers live in a very sophisticated and complex culture. I think that causes them to fall prey to all kinds of spiritual delusions. For some people, they're delusions of grandeur and of these mighty things that God is doing through them, I am uh, doing a teaching on the church, and right, and uh, I have been doing a, a series on the the miraculous, uh, the the what are often called the sign gifts in in scripture, and I am just stunned. I've done enough research. I've gone out. Uh, I've actually seen what some people do, what they teach. I'm staggered by their arrogance. I'm, I'm, I'm staggered by their, uh, um, just, just their arrogance relative to some of the ministries that they have. You know, there is so much information, there's so much data, and from all of that, uh, Christians, they get viewpoint after viewpoint and theory after theory and new idea after new idea. There is no new truth. There is no new truth. Over the years, to all of my students, I, we've used a principle in our classes. And you can adjust it if you don't agree with it. It's okay with me. I'm not... But it's just a principle that we have 
I have taught them and developed with them that there is no new truth. And the way that it's stated is that if it's true, it's not new, and if it's new, it's not true. Now, I know that there may be some places where, where God, in a revelatory, not new revelation in terms of Scripture, but just in a, in a, in a historical way, things become more and more clear. I think that in eschatology, that, that uh, revelation is kind of progressive. If you went back and you read the eschatolo eschatological writings of some of the old, old uh, reformed uh, theologians, there was much about eschatology that they didn't understand related to Israel because Israel didn't even exist. And yet when they became a nation in 1948, everything changed. The whole theology changed. Their eschatology changed. Uh, and that's what I mean in terms of the, that there are progressive historical things that God provides to us. But we can just, uh, there are solutions, there are ideas, people are creative. The last thing that you really need to do in the pulpit is to become creative with God's Word. I mean, people can reel off statistics and studies and facts and numbers to the point that it becomes, that you become numb to the very things that are being stated. There's so many multifaceted programs or new church growth approaches. I was at the Christian bookstore, the Lifeway Christian bookstore, a couple of times last week. And uh, I, I had a couple of books that I wanted to get and I wanted to, I always like to look at a book before I buy it. Um, and, uh, but they have a whole section on church growth. And they probably had 150, maybe 200 books in this particular one section called church growth. And I, I just sat there and just looked through some of these books and I was, I was in shock. I was in shock. I was almost appalled at the effort that some people put into new ideas and new creative approaches to, to church, this thing that we call church. There's a, there's a plan for everything. And then we live in an age of religious pragmatism. Pragmatism is a word that means if it works, then it must be good. Well, that's not true. Uh, that's certainly not uh, the way that God wants us to approach Scripture. Things aren't scriptural, scriptural because they're pragmatic. Uh, there, there's a plan, there's a program in place for almost everything. And the point in all of that is that we can have so much in place and so many new ideas and so many creative approaches that we come to a place that we don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. We're not really seeking Him for guidance. we got all of the discipleship books that we need. We've got all the programs in place. We've got all of the kids' programs and the youth programs, and we've got buildings for them, and we've got a staff that takes care of everything and everybody. And before you know it, we've just taken the Holy Spirit and removed Him out of the church. And so there's just a bona fide program in place for almost everything. And we reach that place where the Holy Spirit's guidance is just not necessary anymore. I think that unfortunately the church lives under an illusion, a spiritual illusion. It's the illusion that with enough planning and enough money that it can win the world to Christ it would never be purposely stated that way, but the church is certainly willing to function that way. You have to be very careful about implementing a lot of... I want to be careful in how I say this, in implementing a lot of non-biblical facets into your church setting. 
I'm not encouraging you in any way to to not be thoughtful in what you do and to not be purposeful but what you don't want to do is that you don't want you you want the main thing to stay the main thing you want the priority of scripture to be your priority and you don't want to be so distracted in everything else that surrounds ministry you know I've told my students over the years that I think one of the problems that many that many individuals have in the ministry is that they're they're in love with the ministry they're, they're in love with ministry they're in love with teaching and being in front of people they're in love with being in leadership roles I pastor a small church I don't pastor some large mega church I'm here because God called me here and uh, I'm, I, I will probably be here until I die. I, I never intend to leave. Where God called me, these are the sheep that He's given me to shepherd. And we have, we have priorities. We have a very well-defined spiritual focus, and that focus is teaching and preaching the Word of God. It is the priority of every service. Uh, we don't even have the ability to have what a lot of large churches may have. I'm not saying that those things are necessarily wrong. There's nothing wrong with music or children's program or youth program. There's nothing wrong with any of that. I'm just saying it cannot become the priority. It cannot become the focus of what you're doing. If someone wanted to, they could go to a different seminar every week on how to grow a church or how to win people to Christ or how to develop a men's program or how to do this or how to do that. They could. I get, I am inundated with mail to go to all these seminars. Everything from taxes to youth groups to, to uh, uh, worship to, to teaching. It, it, just, it just goes, it's... It's never ending. I could go every week somewhere to a seminar. And uh, the, the, the spiritual climate that abounds is a world of pragmatism. It's a world of common sense and of plans and programs. And quite frankly, the church has in an almost clinical way simply removed the Holy Spirit from the church and from its life. The result is simple to see. Rarely is a supernatural outworking of God ever truly seen in the midst of a church or even people's personal lives. I mean, if I were to ask the question, whatever happened to prayer in churches? Where did that go? What happened to the enormous, powerful influence that corporate prayer has? You know, in most churches, uh, I know where I live in the area of the country that I live in, they normally had what they call prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I and mean, we have a service on Wednesday night as well. But it used to just simply be called prayer meeting. But nobody prays. It's a, there's a little prayer at the beginning. It maybe lasts 15 minutes. Uh, uh, I've been in churches where they started... They were going to have a, a period of time designated. I mean, just the entire service was going to be designated to prayer. And the attendance fell so quickly and so swiftly that they had, they deleted that from their service and went back to something else. Um, you see, the real issue is what Paul mentioned in Galatians 3. Having begun in the Spirit, each believer must continue in the Spirit. And when the sinner came to Christ, it was simply because he was convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit and he was given the grace to believe by the Holy Spirit. And so believers may be able to give someone the gospel message. You know, that's, that's what we do. We take the gospel to someone. We give them the gospel. Very, very simple message. I know, for instance, when... 
I'm out in the bush areas uh, in Africa that I have a way of presenting the gospel by drawing it on the ground. I have God over here, I have man over here, I have fire coming up from the bottom, and I eventually draw a cross over connecting man to God as the bridge, the only bridge. Um, it's, it's a fairly simple message. I, I'm through in 15 minutes. And it's amazing. Multitudes of people come to Christ. Multitudes. Just all the time. Come to Christ and remain with Christ through that simple message of the gospel. So, somebody can give the gospel message, but the conviction is something that must be produced in them by the Holy Spirit. I mean, a lost man is so depraved that he will never on his own see the utter sinfulness of his condition. Never. He will never agree to it on his own. He will think that he's better than everybody else. He's better than the hypocrites down at the church. He's better than these people over here. He is a good person. He will never come to a place of understanding about his own utter sinfulness and his own condition. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can create that contrition and that conviction that leads to repentance in the life of a lost person. And I can preach the Word, you can preach the Word, somebody may be saved, um, but it's only because the Holy Spirit was working in that individual's life working in their heart and bringing about within them a conviction of sin and this deep, deep desire to repent. I remember the night that I was saved. At the, I remember it just as clear as it, as it happened last night. And I just broke down and just wept and wept and wept. I was in somebody's apartment and... Somebody just knocked on the door and came in and began to... They weren't even talking to me. They were talking to somebody else about Christ. And I realized how lost I was. And I broke down and I just wept and wept and wept. I, I, you know, for the first time in my life I felt clean and not dirty. And I probably wept... I know this is going to sound a little over the top, but it's accurate, it's true. I'm not saying it... Uh, draw attention to me, I wept for about two and a half hours. Just wept. I, I, I would stop and kind of <gasps> sob and then I'd start thinking about what had just happened again. And I, it just, I, I went home, I told my mom and um, I, just, I just wept. I, I couldn't stop. It was a real dynamic work of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't something that I could create. And apart from his work in, a, in an unbeliever's life, nobody would ever be saved. Nobody would ever be convicted of sin. No one would ever repent of their sin. So once again, why are so many Christians not praying for this to happen and praying for the supernatural and convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit to fall on the hearts and lives of lost men and women? I mean, what would ever make a believer think that they could save someone through their own effort. What would ever make me personally, as a believer, think that I had the power to create that kind of work in somebody? So the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. He gives the desire to repent. He gives the grace to respond to the truth. And then He regenerates the sinner, and brings them into the kingdom of God. Salvation is always, always a work of God. It's always a work of the Holy Spirit. And the very moment, and at the very moment of salvation, which has been both initiated and completed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then comes and indwells that individual. Now, there, there's nothing that I'm saying here that should be new to you as a believer, unless you're just a very, very young believer. But the point in all of this, and the emphasis in everything that is being communicated 
is that we begin in through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Christian life begins through the work of the Holy Spirit. It is a marvelous work. It's, a, it's an incredible work that takes place. But it's a work of the Holy Spirit. For me to think that I can continue without that work in my life is, is, is a, one of the most spiritually erroneous erroneous ideas that a believer could possibly have. In Acts chapter 2, after Peter had preached this very powerful message in Jerusalem at Pentecost, the people were just deeply stirred and convicted by the message. It wasn't because Peter was a great powerful preacher. Just trust me, that's not the message there in Acts chapter 2. I mean, if you just look just a month before that, how Peter was, uh, so, you know, Peter was uh, uh, cowing down before a young girl. You know, he had lost his conviction about Christ. And yet, uh, here he's been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He is filled uh, with the Holy Spirit, he preaches a message out of the Word of God. And people are just convicted to the very core of their being. And this is what they said in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 38. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What shall we do? I mean, they, they, this, there was such a powerful movement of God... They just heard a message. It didn't last that long. And they said, what shall we do? It was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And they, he said, you will receive a gift. An amazing gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, it says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 6, Paul asked two questions, and they were both directly related to the simple fact that the body of a believer is the actual temple of the Holy Spirit. And he asked the Corinthians twice. He said, do you not know Have you forgotten? Is there something here that you don't understand? Do you not know that your body is the very temple, the very dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that the Holy Spirit indwells you? So how could all of this be summarized and maybe a few more things added to it? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts the believer of sin. He makes them alive to the Word of God. He brings them to repentance. He gives them faith to believe. He births them into God's kingdom. He indwells them. He places them into the body of Christ. He gives them spiritual gifts. He seals them as the guarantee of God's work within their life. He begins the work of sanctification within them. He sets them free from the law of sin and death. He gives life to their mortal bodies. He leads them in their daily lives. He bears witness with their spirits they, that they are the children of God. So what's the point? What's the point of all of that? Well, it's really very simple. It's that a believer cannot live the Christian life apart from the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in their life. Having begun in the Spirit, every believer must continue in the Spirit. What an incredibly tr 
tragic thing for the Christian to neglect, to ignore, to refuse the work of the Holy Spirit within them, to ignore His Word, to just treat His church in such a casual, flippant, and superficial way. There are not many subjects, I think, more vital to study than this one relative to the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. Anything that's going to help you to live out your Christian life more effectively is something that must come from the Holy Spirit. It's His work. There's no other source of spiritual life. It doesn't exist. You can't even read the Word of God without the Spirit's presence helping you to understand what it means. And I think that anyone who ignores these incredibly vital truths that we're going to be studying, they'll find themselves becoming spiritually numb and spiritually dead to the things of God. The ultimate ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life is to exalt the person of Christ to you. Why does He do that? What is His purpose in exalting the purpose of Christ? It's so that you can see Christ for who He is and then submit your full life to Him. So that you can become a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ. That's why he exalts Christ to the believer. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 12 through 18 says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This passage is speaking of Exodus chapter 34, when Moses went up on the mountain to meet God and he, he saw the backside of God's glory. And the, responding, the, the corresponding effect was that when he saw that glory, that that glory of God actually began to reflect on Moses in such a way that his entire face was shining. And the point that Paul is making, especially in verse 18, is that as the believer gazes on the glory of the person of Christ, that that glory of Christ begins to reflect back on them. That's why the Holy Spirit is so intense and so intent on magnifying and exalting Christ to you as a believer. The more that you see Christ, the more that you will become like Christ. And the more that He will be reflected in your life. Every believer exists for the glory of God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 through 11 says, Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So as the glory of Christ is beheld, 
the believer becomes more and more like him each day. But who is it that's actually doing this for the believer? How does all of this actually take place in the believer's life? Well, it's there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit that's bringing about this transformation. It's the Holy Spirit that is making these changes in the believer's life. So what does the Holy Spirit want to do? The Holy Spirit wants to show every believer the glory of Christ. I can say this to you, I think, in a personal level. You can adjust it if you need to. But it's my opinion that if a believer is not in some way constantly reflecting on the person of Christ, reading those passages that deal about Christ, meditating on the person of Christ, that for the most part, they will not grow in any dynamic way whatsoever in their Christian life. That is the primary, ultimate ministry of the Holy Spirit, is to exalt Christ to you personally. So there's a tremendous amount of Scripture here related to the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, it has more concentrated teaching on the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit than any other place in all of Scripture. Obviously, there are other places that do. But now we find ourselves in a no-condemnation status. And what we want to do, what we've tried to do in this one class, is to look down at the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit from the 30,000-foot level and just to see how broad and how extensive it really is and how critical it is for our life so that we might reflect Christ in all that we do. And I would say that unfortunately that many Christians do not have a good substantial understanding of the Holy Spirit. Some of them are actually afraid of them, uh, afraid of Him. They have, they have been afraid of certain doctrines uh, in the church, and so they don't have uh, they don't have an understanding of his work in their life. They probably do not have much of a meaningful relationship with him. It's what was declared earlier that a believer cannot live out the Christian life on their own. It is a spiritual life that demands a spiritual source for its proper outworking in the believer's life.